All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, this is a huge room. Feel free to move forward so it doesn't feel quite so big. Um, hope you all had a good first or maybe second day of KubeCon this year. We're going to talk today a little bit about GPUs with Kubernetes and virtual kubelets. And, uh, well, let's get going. My name is Dean Troyer. I'm with Salad Technology. Um, we're a relatively new uh, GPU cloud provider, um, distributed clouds in all sorts of locations, distributed GPUs, I, I should say. Um, this talk was actually uh, proposed and primarily written by Gautam Venema, who is unable to be here today. Um, so it is just me. Um, we're going to talk a little bit. I've got a, I've got a, a story about a mythical app that um, needs some AI capabilities, and uh, we're going to kind of walk through how, uh, how you might add that capability to an existing platform. Um, we'll look a little bit about what they've got, the back end, and what the, what the exact needs are. And then we'll examine one, spe one specific solution that, um, spoiler alert, it's a virtual kubelet, and uh, look at how that can, uh, can solve their problems. And if the demo wins are uh, favorable for us today, we're actually going to walk through bringing one up. So our story is around um, an app called Slackers at Work. This is a mythical app that uh, has a feature called the Slacker Tracker. Um, everybody's worked with a guy probably named Joe Doolittle who takes 30 minutes to get his coffee in the morning. He spends two hours at lunch. He's got to make the rounds of all the departments before coffee break. Um, and this app is for people to keep track of where he's at at any given time. We've all worked with somebody like him, probably more so before 2020 than now. But anyway, that's, that's the situation that we're in. It's just your basic mobile app. And they've decided, product has decided, that they want to add QR code tracking to this app. So all you got to do is point your phone at Joe to mark exactly where he is at any given time. Uh, like, like too many product teams, they leave the implementation of getting the QR code onto Joe as a, as a detail that someone else will solve. Now, more realistically, it's a, it's a cloud-based app, so they don't really have any local hosting abilities. You know, they don't, they don't operate any of their own servers. It's all, it's all cloud-based, um, which means they also don't have any data center resources, any of that usual stuff. And their existing cloud provider, uh, well, let's just say they don't have an affordable GPU offering without minimum spend commitments and all sorts of other things that a, that a small app like this doesn't, really just can't, can't afford to deal with. Which also means that they're not heavily invested in, in too much beyond the base um, the base orchestration of, of their stuff. And, um, and of course, uh, their app is currently all based around Kubernetes. Now, if unlike Slackers, you do have uh, some local hosting abilities, you know, one of your options is to, to get your own GPUs. Um, that alone seems to be part of the trick, at least to do it affordably. Uh, but the considerations are pretty much all the same as for hosting anything else yourself. You know, you need your physical facilities, um, ping power pipe, and um, you've still got the problem of orchestrating workloads onto those GPUs. Um, in terms of, of looking for a cloud provider, you know, obviously you're going to look first at leveraging whatever existing relationships, whatever investments you may have. Um, some folks are eligible for some free credits that are useful, uh, free credits expire, and you've got, like I said, the minimum spend commitments as an issue. And you may have new APIs to deal with, either with an existing provider, clearly with a, uh, with a new provider, you're going to have probably a different API. Um, so being able to use your existing orchestration tooling, you know, your Ansible's, your uh, Terraform or whatever, uh, is of a great benefit. 
So in summary, uh, slackers are looking for, uh, for a solution they've got, existing Kubernetes clusters. Um, they're managing it mostly with Helm right now. They're pretty basic. And uh, they're fully buzzword compatible otherwise. And they need these additional external GPUs to build their QR codes. Um, they want to use Stable Diffusion with QR Monster and make fun codes, or more specifically, they want to try and disguise them so you don't see them on Joe quite so easily. So our solution, as I mentioned, is a virtual kubelet that will connect to a GPU cloud. Um, today, we're going to use one that, oddly enough, I'm kind of familiar with, and uh, that offers this particular cloud <laughs> salad, offers thousands of distributed GPUs running containers on gaming PCs around the world. So what is a virtual kubelet? Um, it's essentially a translation layer that takes uh, Kubernetes control plane events and translates them into something else, another API most often, to allow you to orchestrate external resources via the commands and the tooling that you're already used to. Um, you can run more than one. So you can tune and schedule things in particular ways. Um, you can control what gets scheduled onto those. And uh, the virtual kubelet here shown is a process, not a physical node. We've got the three nodes running the regular kubelet process. This is a, just a process, and you could run it in your cluster. Um, you know, we've, we've all probably heard the stories about people who brought up their first cloud and they put their DNS in their cloud and then they couldn't cold start it. Uh, we're not going to have that problem because the virtual kubelet's not part of the critical path in bringing up your cluster. <clears throat> so we're going to extend Kubernetes to use the existing primitives, the existing tooling to orchestrate the workloads out to these GPUs. And most external providers like this are going to have provider-specific metadata that clearly Kubernetes doesn't know anything about. Um, there are mechanisms, of course, to get that into your specs and pipe that information down to the external API that you're talking to. One of the other things that, uh, that's a benefit of doing this with external stuff, especially if now in, in Slacker's case, this isn't it, but if you're dealing with something that's a publicly visible endpoint, putting these outside of your cluster, even outside of your entire network, um, can be a benefit. And I mean, it also can be a drawback for some workloads. You, you want that close network connectivity. And that is one of the downsides of virtual kubelets is um, it's if, if anything at all, it's weak in being able to orchestrate your network back into your regular cluster. But for things that fit that model well, um, that don't need you know, a tightly coupled network, um, this works pretty well. Basically, we're gonna, we're gonna take multiple external things, and, and in this case, GPUs, and present them to your Kubernetes cluster as a single pool. Um, basically Cloud 101 type stuff. But we can also label, you know, if we're running multiple virtual kubelets, we can label them. There's, you know, all the usual ways of determining what workloads run on which systems. So this is your basic Kubernetes diagram. The left side should be very familiar to all of you. It's a, you know, a control plane with some nodes around it and, uh, and a, a user, an application out front. The green box in the middle is the virtual kubelet. And as I said earlier, that is just a process. Um, this is a logical diagram physically. It's probably going to run on one of those other physical nodes. It is taking the control plane events meant for it and translating them into, in our case, solid cloud API calls that takes those GPUs, they look like pods to Kubernetes, and they look like they're all running on one giant node. The, the virtual kubelet process itself is probably a single go binary. 
Um, virtual Kubelet is a, the, the project, there's a repo, um, is a library that defines a set of Go interfaces that you have to implement to, to write your backend provider. Um, but that's what provides the standard um, Kubernetes side of the, of the connector. Um, I'm not aware of this being done in any other language at this point. Um, it would be interesting to, to know, but I think pretty much everybody's going to do this and go. So it makes it a relatively lightweight thing to run. Um, if your budget is being soaked up by, uh, by paying for GPUs, then maybe you need to run it on a Raspberry Pi. But again, no need for that. We can just run it in the cluster itself. Um, in our case, we have a little Helm chart included in the repo for our virtual kubelet that does a very basic deployment of it. Um, that's a sample Helm chart. But basically, this is just going to tell you that um, we're using Helm to bring up the virtual kubelet directly. So let me check one thing real quick. That's green awesomeness. So let's try it. Let's see what we can do. I am running Docker desktop with the Kubernetes on my laptop here. So this is all very local. Demo. And I've scripted a few of these things just for simplicity. So when you start that up clean, you're only going to have one node. That's the control plane and no pods. The Let's do a start. And because the Helm install command is, is a little long, um, can I highlight this for you? That's the Helm install command that we use. Um, the configuration, at least in our case, is all done via uh, command line options. So you'll see some, you know, some uh, salad specific things in there. You'll see like the namespace that we're going to use and uh, naming the naming the process itself. And what that looks like is now we have at the bottom is the pod running our virtual kubelet process, and up in the nodes you'll see the KC demo VK. That is the kubelet agent ready to receive. Um, ready to receive things. Let's see. It looks like I put the wrong tab up on this side. This is, oh, come on. There we go. This is Salad Cloud Portal. Um, this is where we're going to look from the Salad side at what we're running. Uh, container group in our context maps to a Q, uh, Kubernetes pod. So back over here, cube cuddle apply, demo qr.yaml. And that's pretty straightforward. Let's see what it did. So we have two pods that are coming up. And again, if the, if the winds are blowing in the right direction, we will see those pods appear over here soon. Um. <laughs> nice. I should know better than to try this. I should have recorded it. Lesson to us all. You don't let yourself get too cocky. Um, just for fun, I actually have... This isn't just to, just to show you what it might look like. This is what it should look like. Um, once you get in to look at what what is running, we've got a we've got an instance of a QR code generator. And fortunately, because this is the one we're actually going to look at, um, this image is six gigabytes and takes a few minutes to get set up. Uh, and I didn't want to wait on that, but uh, this is what it looks like. We've got five GPUs running behind this thing right now. Um, still nothing. Dadgum it. I didn't realize this was going to be so close. So anyway, <clears throat> obviously slackers at work would not be using a, a form like this. But, uh, oh, I've already got it in there. Joe Doolittle. 
we're going to make his QR code. So that's what the code would look like by itself. But yeah, plaid flannel shirt. Joe likes to wear flannel. So uh, let's, uh, where is it? There it is, build one. There's a little checkbox down here too to validate it to make sure that it's actually readable. Generating, generating, generating. I don't know, does that count as a, a plaid flannel shirt for Joe Doolittle? Let me see if it works. Oh, good grief. Yeah, works for me. Now, and I say that because we have had some people on Android have these things not be quite as reliable. There's, there's tuning, there's all kinds of things that go into that yet. Um, this demo app was put together by our solutions architect, Sean Ruszewski. And uh, we, we were talking about this last night, and it, it's just, um, we're not going to spend, we decided not to spend that time trying to get it. But it also gave us here, this ran on a 3060 Ti, 8 gigabyte of VRAM, uh, you know, took about three seconds. And down here at the bottom, we have the data content. So anyway, you think, you think somebody could print that on a sticker and get that on Joe's back without him knowing it? Um, let's see. Oh, just for grins, I want to see if this thing ever came up. Of course not. But at least to show you that uh, Even if it doesn't work, we still have standard commands at our disposal. Let's get rid of it. And now they're terminating. So that is, uh, that is what it looks like um, in, a very, in a very quick sort of uh, application. Now I gotta find that window, go back full screen. <clears throat> this is a, another just simplified diagram of, of what it actually looks like. You know, we've got the Kubernetes on the left, the virtual kubelet in the middle, and then the solid cloud API. And um, like I said, GPUs around the world um, waiting to, uh, to do fun things. And by golly, without a demo, that didn't take as long as I thought it was going to. Um, we are here, booth E27, if you want to know more about Salad itself, and if you want to know more about the Kubelet stuff, and especially the proof of concept that we built, um, get a hold of me, and we can go from there. Do, uh, geez, do we have any questions? We've got a microphone over here. This is a huge room, <laughs> if you wouldn't mind. The, can we get the question mic up? Well, speak up and I'll repeat your question. We don't need to wait all that. At the level that we did here today, you won't have that. You can always, inside your container, build that in. You would have to build that into your container to tunnel back into your internal infrastructure. Unfortunately, virtual kubelet itself doesn't do much for networking. The, the implementations that I've looked at that, that claim to support a little bit of networking, they're all pretty much doing it themselves, one way or another. So yeah, this isn't necessarily going to work for every job, but for the ones that fit it, it works. So my question is on a similar vein. Um, what kind of network isolation do you support for your distributed <coughs> Like, Can you only allow access from the virtual kubelet um, since these are hosted on the public internet? What, I guess what kind of network isolation do you support? 
Um, the question, I forgot to repeat the first question, I apologize. The question is what sort of network isolation do we have um, for, the, for the GPUs in our GPU network? Um, the GPUs are networked back to our internal um, hubs and things via WireGuard. So we've got that all, they're, they're completely isolated. Um, the, we've got level of organization, organization and project, so we can isolate that at a project level and we can isolate it individually. So the GPUs may or may not be able to even talk to each other if they're in the same thing. Like the five that I showed right now, they can't even talk to each other. They're completely isolated. You can of course always build that into your container, but by the default, it's, it's completely isolated to just that GPU back to our, um, our front end, our load balancing front end. All right. I think it's working now. All right. Uh, my question is about the GPUs. Are you able to schedule multiple uh, clients, let's say, on one GPU? Can we split a GPU with the way that you're arranging things? Right now, I'm, I'm going to say to clients, no, you're going to get one workload per GPU. If you have a workload that can handle multiple things at once, at that level, yeah, you can do that. Basically, what we're doing is taking a container that needs a GPU to do whatever it's going to do and running it, you know, on that machine locally. So, um, I mean, like this demo app, of course, you can have multiple people hitting that endpoint at the same time. You know, it's not, it's not single-threaded or anything like that. It's what you would expect. I but, guess what I'm looking for is not, scheduling. we're not yeah. fragmenting and, and running multiple workloads on a, on a single GPU. Gotcha. Thank you. Hi. Um, I was a little bit curious about the uh, relationship between one virtual kubelet that then maps to all these different physical machines under the hood, physical GPUs. Uh, just intuitively, it seemed to me that I would want to have a virtual kubelet per physical machine to avoid running into situations where you might request resources that like cross a, a boundary to multiple uh, physical machines that then would incur high latency overhead, whereas if you had just scaled your request down a little bit to what fits on a single device, you could pack it all together more efficiently. So I'm curious, is that something that's very easy to configure to have like multiple of these virtual kubelets or is that like the best practice for this approach? Um, I'm not sure I can speak to what is the best practice, but you can run multiple virtual kubelets. You know, if you wanted to segregate, in, in our example, if you wanted to segregate all of the GPUs with 16 gig or more VRAM, you could configure it so that you know, that's in one virtual kubelet and all the smaller, maybe less powerful GPUs are in a different one. Um, our system has the ability to do that through the filtering. You know, the stuff that we would add as attributes to the workload, and then we'll handle that sort of thing. We can select what class we want to run on. But uh, anything else like that, you could run multiple. The other thing is you could run one virtual kubelet per provider. Um, in fact, I think there might be one out there that does multiple providers built in, one per process, but the same code will handle multiple providers. Okay. So virtual kubelet itself, the library doesn't restrict any of that. But in is there the, any particular reason to prefer the way that you showed it, where you have just one virtual kubelet mapping to a potentially infinite pool of uh, physical machines? That's the, I guess that's the common way. Um, Partially because if you're going to run one virtual kubelet per physical node, now you have to bring those up and down. That's your, that's your control plane. You don't want to be managing that on workloads or anything like that. I mean, it's, it's like adding a node to your cluster. You know, that's not something that, well, I guess it is in some cases, something that you scale out automatically. Um, but I don't think you have to worry about it. The virtual kubelet isn't actually... Yeah, whatever your control plane load is, is the volume of data that it handles. I mean, it's not like it's going to scale there badly. Um, in this particular case, it's just simpler. And the way I've seen, I think the Azure one works like this. It's just one pool. Now, like for us, we configure the virtual kubelet for down to the project level. So, you know, we've got a, like a, an organization and an organization can have multiple projects we have to give the virtual kubelet those two bits of information. So if you want to run multiple projects, you're running multiple virtual kubelets. 
So in terms of breaking up what's behind it, that would be, in our case, that would be the way you would have to do it. Below that, it's your choice. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Morning. Good morning. Uh, first off, I feel attacked about the flannel comments. I'm really upset about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> apologies. I hope your name isn't Joe. <laughs> no, not Joe, unfortunately. <laughs> um, how does this look for like an on-prem? If I have on-prem GPUs in virtual kubelet, how do you can you reach out to an on-prem another Kubernetes cluster, for instance, or you know, do you leverage GPUs in a different cluster? In, in what I showed, you cannot. You would have, like I said earlier, you would have to build that into your container via, I don't know, set up your own wire guard or something to come back into your infrastructure. Um, if you're pointing the virtual kubelet at another internal cloud, you know, let's say you've got a Proxmox or something sitting over to the side, whatever it's got available to it network-wise. Again, the virtual kubelet isn't doing much for your networking. If you can set up your network so that it, the cloud that it's talking to can do what you need, that's how you'd have to go about it. That's external from the kubelet. Okay, I was thinking more sense? along like the G, I was thinking more like the GPUs. I mean, can I just have GPUs in one cluster and then have another cluster that just calls the GPUs across? Or do I have to use like, something more complex like Salad or some other virtual GPU? No, you can, you can do it yourself. I think I might have buzzed past it pretty quickly. Um, there are other solutions for doing things like this natively within Kubernetes without doing the virtual kubelet okay. to get there. And that might make more sense for that situation. Okay. Um, again, because this is, this is what we are, we tailored it to that. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Um, quick follow-up question to the previous, previous question. It's a technical one. Um, this kubelet, the virtual kubelet presents me with like 10,000 GPUs, you know, right. potentially. So let's, what if I schedule a pod that requests 100 GPUs? How do you solve that, that that pod will never get scheduled, but I also know about it? Do you use an admission controller, or what prevents it from trying to do stuff like this? As our code sets right now, you would get 100 pods. Um, it's one GPU per pod. Uh, that's one of the things we just haven't gotten to yet. Salad itself can run, mm -hmm. I think I showed you, in that, in that one mm -hmm. workload, we had five GPUs sure. underneath one endpoint. I think my question is, if I schedule a single pod requesting 100 GPUs. Right. We can't, right now, this can't do that. Of course not. But my question is, how do you prevent it? It just, it oh. stays, because it will try to schedule it on the virtual kubelet, because it has 10,000 GPUs. Um, if it doesn't have the resources, it should fail. But it has uh, the resource it? technically. You know, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to answer that well. Okay. Um, I, that seems to be more of a, of a Kubernetes internals thing. I am not a Kubernetes expert, unfortunately. No worries. Thank you. All right. I'm, apologies. Uh, nice talk. This is Yuan Chen from Apple. So first, a comment on previous question about the shared GPU. Uh, so as some of you may already and uh, yeah be aware, so with the recent uh, the NVIDIA GPU device plug-in and also Kubernetes support, and uh, actually we can share or virtualize a physical GPU, right? And there are time slicing and sharing and uh, multi-process sharing or probably most interesting is called a MIG and a multi-instance GPU. Okay, so let's come to my question. And, uh, mm -hmm. So the virtual node definitely is a good solution, right? For the flexible capacity from provider, you mentioned uh, serverless and edge computing. But when we compare, right, with the native and uh, GPU support now, right, they are already in the device plugin. Most recently in the community have something called the dynamic resource allocation, resource claim. So I want, and uh, so can you comment, right, compare this native supported GPU node solution with this and using the virtual and the Kubernetes or virtual nodes? So in particular, what about the complexity and the administrative overhead that introduced by the virtual Kubernetes? If we, I want to run a GPU cluster, right? What would be the better solution? Or it's depending on the use cases. I'm, unfortunately, like I said, I'm not a Kubernetes expert, so I'm not sure that I can compare the two. Um, the, 
management overhead that we introduce is basically the virtual kubelet process. And then whatever you have to manage on, on the back end that you're using. Um, I'm not familiar with the other, the other things that you mentioned, unfortunately. Okay, it's fair. I am just mentioning means you can sure. run definitely support the GPU node right natively without. Yeah, I would guess. Yeah, my personal opinion probably really depending on the use cases. Yeah, I think both will have their applications. Okay, thank it's, you very exactly. much. Yeah, not everything is going to fit for this. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the talk, and it's a great idea. And I'm Tao from Google. I have a question about: um, Do we need to change the workload to specify? Like I want to use Starlight Cloud in the port. Like as a, as a, uh, so in my port specs, do I need to make some change? Yes, if, if um, where, where am I here? Let me show you that. We've got a couple minutes yet. Also to share some background, and I think today the Kubernetes GPU API is it's not that standard, and it's like specify how many GPU I need for this port. There's no GPU type and no GPU driver version. And how can I know the GPU I get will will be installed when the desired driver version and the desired GPU type? That's a that's a hard problem, and that's one we do have already. Um, We've got a relatively standard um, management container that we push out in terms of the drivers that are pre-installed on our GPUs. You know, we're going to give you, we can tell you what version of CUDA it has, for example. Um, so in, in this case, you know, that's a, that's a known. As far as, this is, the, this is the YAML that I used to attempt to launch it, and those annotations there in the middle, that's the solid specific information um, that we needed for the, for our workload. Basically, we're the GPU classes. Unfortunately, that's a UUID, um, but that represents in Salad a, a class called Stable Diffusion Compatible. So it's a wide range of of you know cards and and memory capabilities, um, and the rest of it is is just the configuration for the app itself. The other bit in here that is different is at the bottom the tolerations. Um, I don't have in my head exactly what it was we set on the virtual kubelet itself to match that. But that's how you control gotcha. which Thank virtual kubelet you're going to yeah, run on. Yeah, that answers my question. Thanks. OK. Yeah. Anyone else? Great. Well, thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, we really appreciate it. And like I said, we're in E27, and hopefully that scans for you. Anyway, thank you.